My first guest says that Vladimir Putin is, quote, determined to shape the future to look like his version of the past and that he craves legitimacy. Fiona Hill has been studying the Russian president for many, many years, and during the Trump administration, she served as a senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council. She's now senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and her latest book is called There Is Nothing For You Here. Fiona Hill, welcome back to our program. Um, let, let me ask you first what you make of what we just saw, Russians leaving to avoid this conscription, and at the same time, apparently, a key spin doctor on state television criticizing this conscription and the mobilization. It's kind of rare to hear that criticism in public like that. Well, it's also fascinating, Christiane, because one of the reasons that the mobilization has taken place, this supposedly partial mobilization of 300,000 people, which, of course, we're now hearing rumors that it might be many more than that and maybe even as many as a million, part of the impetus for that was having hard right hawkish commentators on Russian television, in fact, urging mobilization. And if you recall back to May of this year, when Vladimir Putin was presiding over the annual May Day victory celebrations to commemorate the end of World War II, there was a lot of speculation on that day of May 9th that there would be a full mobilization of the Russian military in response to the war in Ukraine. And it didn't happen because analysts uh, at the time believed that it would be far too difficult for Putin to fully mobilize because there would be this backlash. So he's been pulled in these different directions, or he's pulled himself in these different directions, and we're now actually seeing exactly what a lot of people predicted, that there would be a lot of resistance to mobilization. Although whether people really predicted that tens of thousands of people would be fleeing across the borders, you know, is, is of course another question. Would you agree that this time has the added issue of the Kremlin saying that the United States is getting, you know, coming close to becoming a party and with all their threats against that. But also, you know, yeah, yeah, given the fact that they might use this annexation to then directly confront or up the ante militarily against the US or NATO, um, and even, you know, this whole idea of a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine itself. Well, and look, there are commentators um, around the Kremlin, many of whom actually used to work in Western think tanks, who are going beyond the use of a tactical nuclear weapon and actually urging the use of a strategic nuclear weapon against the United States, or even, you know, one of them has gone as far as to say Poland or some other European country. So let's just say there's a lot of rhetoric going on here right now, and it's all part of the same objective, which is to change the discussion. Putin doesn't like what's happened on the ground in Ukraine, with the Ukrainians pushing back and being able to retake territory around Kharkiv and um, some of the other regions. And Putin wants to consolidate what he's already got on the ground. He's uh, basically made a whole host of announcements. First of all, obviously, that Crimea is Russia's and will never be given up. Then recognising Donetsk and Luhansk, the two republics that make up the Donbass region, even though Russia is, or Russian proxies are not in full control of those two regions. Uh, so he's announced um, already on the eve of the invasion that they were recognised as independent and now wants to um, annex them as well. And then the Russians have moved into two other major regions, Kherson and Zaporizhia, which give them then control of all of the infrastructure, including water and road and rail that goes into Crimea. They've had referenda there as well, and the question is whether they intend to annex them too, because Putin's also said that Russia is here to stay. So he's changing the facts on the ground, he's dismembering Ukraine, he's digging in, and now he's trying to change the whole discussion to make this a negotiation with the West and the United States, because he's doing, you know, what we've seen many times before, which is nuclear threats. And remember, Putin's done this before in the past as well, and he's basically saying, now you all have to negotiate with me and sue for peace. And that means recognising what we have done on the ground in Ukraine. Can I ask you um, a question really about the tempo and the intention of what we've seen, which is a huge help by NATO, the West, the United States, led, obviously. But the former Russian foreign minister, Andrei Kozarev, said to me on, on this program, you can't just go step by step when you're trying to confront Putin and give him a message. It has to be a punch in the nose, a punch in the face. 
And I'm wondering whether you agree with that, that that should have been, you know, the case from, from the beginning. And is the West losing some momentum by going more methodically, perhaps, than certainly the Ukrainians would like? They'd like a lot more sophisticated and longer-range artillery, aircraft, and the lot to actually give the Russians that punch in the nose on the ground. Well, let's just be very clear. The Ukrainians already have punched him in the nose. I mean, basically by retaking Kharkiv and pushing back, and this is why he's responding. So Kozadev, of course, the former foreign minister, I mean, he knows what he's speaking about. I mean, he was working in that context as well. And people might remember back in the early 1990s, he was the person who actually uh, warned uh, the West that the hardliners were coming back into power under Boris Yeltsin. So he's obviously somebody who's very steeped in these larger dynamics. And he's not wrong. I mean, of course, the dilemma for the US government and for other Western governments has been to try to contain this conflict. Now, I think we have to accept that it's not contained and that we are now the home front as well. Once we got into this dynamic, this escalatory dynamic, it was inevitable that we would get to this place. And it also, I know a lot of people have been pushing, well, we have to negotiate and, you know, we have to pay an awful lot of attention to what Russia is asking for. But that won't solve the problem. We are now in a dynamic which has having all kinds of global knock-on effects. And again, uh, the point here is that Putin sees and has seen for a very long time that he is in a direct struggle with the West and that for him, Ukraine is just part of that. He's been saying this since 2007, 2008. We've been in this situation, frankly, since the annexation of Ukraine in 2014. Mm. And it's really incumbent upon us right now to shore up our own resilience and to you know, maintain the unity and to be very clear eyed about what's happening here. Putin thinks he's lost momentum. He's trying to take it. He's trying to push forward in every front that he that he can because he believes that we will capitulate. And so what he's trying to do now is not just turn the tide on the ground in Ukraine, but he's trying to turn the tide in the capitals of every European and uh, uh, US uh, supporter of Ukraine. He's basically trying to say, you are now at peril. And, 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 and again, what, what he's doing here, this is, this is complete and utter nuclear blackmail with the tactical and intermediate and strategic nuclear weapons. There's been a lot of things in the paper recently saying it's like the Cuban Missile Crisis. It absolutely isn't. This is not about the United States or the West manoeuvring new categories of nuclear weapons. This is pure and simple Vladimir Putin losing his place on the battlefield and trying to blackmail us all into capitulating. It's no different from what Kim Jong-un has been doing in North Korea. Okay. And so we have to recognize now exactly what we're dealing with. Okay, so that's really interesting. You say no different than what Kim Jong... And he, when he's faced with a strong response, tends to back off Kim Jong. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't followed through with all his threats and his, his rhetoric. But what do you think of, of Putin will do? You said he's now throwing everything at it and he hopes that the West will capitulate. Do you think there's a point at which the West will capitulate? You've just talked about the energy. We know that people in the West are hurting, particularly in Europe, not so much in the United States, um, with energy and, and, and people around the world with the food insecurity, all coming from this problem. Can you see, despite the strong rhetoric coming from the EU, for instance, that unity cracking under this, as you call it, blackmail and pressure with energy? Well, look, the key thing is that we're talking about it, we're recognizing what he's doing and why he's doing it, right? I mean, he obviously calculates that we will. So we have to show him that we will not. So there's going to have to be a multi-pronged approach on the energy front, on issues related to food security, and then also continuing you know, to support Ukraine. And then also, very importantly, the United States is no longer the only nuclear power in the world. China is a nuclear power. Of course, the United Kingdom and France are part of the, the nuclear powers that came out of World War II. But we have India and we have Pakistan. China is, Arsenal is building even further. There are lots of other countries, of course, that have nuclear weapons. And this is then requiring a multinational approach. In the case of Kim Jong-un that we've already talked about, China played a very important role behind the scenes in constraining his ability to do things. We need to keep working with China, with India and with other nuclear powers to push back against this. Because just say that Putin does this, which we have to take seriously, uses a nuclear weapon, this will unbalance strategic stability globally, not just in Europe, but globally. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it will set off a, you know, a sense of chain reactions politically, you know, pun intended here, on every front. And so we're not going to be the only interested parties here. And I think making that point, as the administration has been, you know, we've also heard from uh, Pres uh, Prime Minister Modi of India that this is a time for peace, not of war. But making the point that there will be these further consequences is essential. And keeping, you know, pushing with the international diplomacy is part of this as well. It's incumbent upon us to basically stand up to this and not to basically capitulate. But, of course, he's going to keep on pressing and recognising what he's doing, I think, is part of the ability to be able to push back again. Mm -hmm.